In our last video, we saw how American Airlines was able to improve profitability in the face of new competition from the charter carriers by segmenting the market between business and leisure customers. They then created a new fare product that they would sell to the leisure customers. So in our example, we had two fares, a high fare and a low fare, $150 and $75. And that $75 fare is what American Airlines called the Super Saver, which was a highly discounted, highly restricted fare that was designed to appeal to leisure customers but not be attractive to business customers because it lacked the flexibility that they would normally need. Well, in a current market today, you're certainly going to find more than two fares and sometimes many more than two fares. So let's take a look at a typical fare structure. We're going to use this JFK Miami market again, but we're not going to use the real fares from that, that market. In any given market today, you're going to find somewhere between 6 and 14 published fares, depending on the market and depending on the airline. Now, each one of those fares is going to be signed a letter from the alphabet. In the coach cabin, the highest fare is always Y, and then some combination of letters below that. Each fare, of course, will have a price level, and then some set of restrictions that define the product. So let's choose some uh, numbers and some restrictions to make this look like a typical fare structure. So let's start with, I'm just going to use some numbers that work. Let's say the Y fare is 500. And you know what, let me pause and write this out so I don't waste time. Okay, so I've created an example with some prices and fare rules. For the prices, I simply used $50 increments. And you wouldn't normally see something so evenly spaced. Uh, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about that, but let's first talk about the fair rules. Now remember, the price level along with the rule defines the fair product. And the airline is attempting to create a variety of different fair products that they can sell to different customers. Remember, the original segmentation that we talked about was between business and leisure customers. But because the airline wants to sell more than two fares, they need to segment the market even further. So within those broad categories of business and leisure customers, they, they create different fare products that will have greater and lesser degrees of flexibility that will hopefully um, appeal to different customers within those uh, segments. Now there's certainly overlap between these customers, but the airline is attempting to create products that are different enough that they can then forecast demand for those different products and allocate the seats appropriately. The highest fare in the market comes with no restrictions, so it's a fully refundable, no advance purchase requirements. It's often called the walk-up fare because customers can walk right up to the ticket counter an hour before departure and buy that fare. As we move down the fare structure to the lower fares, we're going to see the restrictions increase. So the uh, next fare, often the airline will include a discounted walk-up fare. And that's because this Y fare is usually so high that if they don't have another walk-up fare, they will lose a portion of the walk-up market. And then this is up to the revenue management analyst to allocate the inventory between these two fares. Next, we start in with our advanced purchase restrictions and we, we move into what could be considered more leisure products. So now to qualify for the $400 fare, a customer needs to buy their ticket seven days in advance. So this is advanced purchase seven days. It's non-refundable, so it comes with a change fee and, and cancellation penalties. They need to purchase a round trip ticket when they uh, buy their fare, so they no need to know when they're coming back. Now certainly some business customers are going to qualify for this because seven days is not that far in advance. A lot of bus business customers do know their plans that far out, but we start getting that overlap between business and leisure customers. The next fare is similar. It's got the uh, advanced purchase seven day requirement, non-refundable round trip. Now the airline's going to add in an additional restriction, a three-day minimum stay. So 
now the customer needs to stay at their destination for three days. And this is an attempt to, to start to put some fences to keep the business customers from buying this fare. Because now business customers often only stay at their destination one or two days. They have their meeting and then they come back. So this is getting further into what might be considered a leisure product. Then as we move down, they add in a 14-day advance purchase. So now this is getting harder for business customers to purchase these, uh, this fare because it's, uh, their plans are usually not that firm two weeks out. It's non-refundable round trip, the minimum stay of three days. Then this next one I added in here has the identical restrictions. And what happens is the airline sort of runs out of combinations of things to create different products, but they do want the different fares in the market. So this would be left up to inventory control. So the analyst, the revenue management analyst, would be responsible for determining how many seats to allocate to each of these fares because there's no restriction. There's no pricing rule restriction that would prevent people from buying the lower fare if it's available. Then getting down into the deeply discounted fares, there's an advanced purchase requirement of 21 days, non-refundable round trip, a minimum stay of three days, and then finally the lowest fare in the market might have a 21-day AP and maybe even a seven-day uh, uh, minimum stay requirement. These are getting uh, less less prevalent in the markets. This is um, this is like a Saturday night stay that used to be very popular, but you don't see it quite as much anymore. So this might be considered a typical fare structure, but it is going to depend a lot on the airline serving the market. So if this was a traditional network carrier that serves a lot of destinations and carries a lot of business customers, you would typically find a higher fare in the market. And that's because those carriers have some customers with a very high willingness to pay and they want to they want to fare out there so that they can capture that willingness to pay. Now at the same time they have a lot of seats they need to sell so they are going to have a very competitive discount fare. If this was a low cost carrier then you would typically not see a very high fare in the market because they just don't carry those kind of customers. They're mostly uh, appealing to leisure customers and their fare structure will reflect that. Their pricing rules will tend to be less restrictive than the network carriers. So some low-cost carriers don't have round-trip stay requirements at all, or round-trip purchase requirements at all, so then they would have no minimum stay requirement. Their advanced purchase may not go quite out, uh, may not um, go out quite so far as 21 days. So they might have the same fares on the low end of the structure that the network carriers have, but they have um, less restrictions. And that is, again, reflective of their leisure base. Now, the distance between these fares, you would never see something um, so nice as $50 increments. What airlines attempt to do is define the distance between their fares so that it's small enough that if they close down one fare or if the pricing rules kick in and prevent customers from buying this fare, that the customers are willing to pay the higher fare uh, and they don't, they don't lose the customer. They also don't want it to be so small that it's not worth the risk. So if, this, you know, if they had a $200 fare and a $205 fare, then they would risk losing customers by, by closing off the $200 fare to get five more dollars. So you wouldn't see something that small. At the same time, you probably wouldn't see a jump from $200 to $400 because then if they close out the $200 fare and ask people to pay $400, those customers not, may, may not fly at all. So the airline is always attempting to find the right distance, and it won't be a similar distance. It will be different as you go up the fare structure. But they're trying to find the distance between these fares that optimize the revenue so that they're, they're getting as much as they can from customers without um, uh, causing them to uh, not fly at all. And that is usually done through trial and error and some analytics. But of course, the, the, fair, the fair environment is very competitive. So airlines can't just unilaterally come up with these distances. They have to put them out in the market and then see how their competitors will respond. I see we're running out of time, so we'll continue this conversation in the next video. See you there.